Good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Krieger, the Artistic Director of the Thomas Circle Singers, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first of our online events as we open our 45th anniversary season. Today, we will be taking a nostalgic look at the early days of TCS and following its development to the present day. Before we get started, I thank our Administrative Director, Aaron Fang, for hosting the event. Thank you, Aaron. I am very excited to be joined today by four prominent and long-term members of the TCS Alto section. Deborah Kennedy Coster is a former two-term TCS board chair and the inaugural recipient of the Deborah Kennedy Coster Service Award. We also have Wendy Bond, TCS librarian, and Wendy Schenk, former singers president. Welcome, Deborah, Wendy, and Wendy. Serving as our moderator today is another TCS Alto, Krista Bradley, who during the day is the Director of Programs and Resources at the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. She also is a former TCS board chair. Welcome, Krista. I am really looking forward to this. Me too. Thanks, Jim. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you here. Um, I'm excited about this conversation, too, and this is such a wonderful opportunity to learn more about the group that we love and to hear personal stories about how it's evolved and changed over the years. Uh, I'll kick it off with some questions, and we'll also encourage all of you watching to submit questions as well. You can use the chat box for that. So to get things started, Oh, and I should also welcome those of you on Facebook Live, so thank you for being here. Uh, to get things started, I'd like to hear how each of you first discovered TCS. What drew you to it? Who'd like to start? Well, um, I've been in TCS. I joined TCS, I think, before anyone else who was on this call, so maybe I should start. Um, I moved to Washington, D.C. in 1984. And I was in a Mennonite church program as a volunteer. So I heard from a Lutheran volunteer that I worked with that there was a choir based at Luther Place Church um, that some of her friends sang with. So I was encouraged to go ahead and, and check it out. Um, of course, TCS was founded um, by a group in Luther Place Church and it was rehearsing there. So I, I went along for an audition and was able to join the group. Well, perhaps I should go next because I think um, after Wendy, I probably uh, came aboard uh, to TCS, um, I guess a few years after that, and also it was through a Mennonite connection. Um, I went to Goshen College, a Mennonite school in the Midwest, and uh, a friend of mine from college had a sister living here in Washington, D.C., who was a singer with Thomas Circle Singers. And this friend knew uh, that I was a singer and would be looking for a new singing home when I moved to D.C. And uh, that's how I found out about Thomas Circle Singers. And I believe I auditioned and got in. And um, here we are. <laughs> If we're going in chronological order, I would be next. Um, in the fall of 1988, I responded to an ad in the want ads in the Washington Post. Of course, that all we had was the printed version back then. But uh, uh, this was a community group looking for a new music director. Um, I had directed a former community chorus before moving to Washington and was itching to get my hands on one again and, and work with one. And so in um, uh, September, October, I responded to this ad and um, in I, probably by November, October, November, I had an audition and an interview. So I guess I'm last as the geezer who still reads the paper Washington Post. Um, I learned about TCS from the radio, specifically from Bill Serre's program in the morning on WETA. Bill used to do the morning program. He would play classical music. Um, he would actually play some opera even sometimes. And 
in between things, he would read the newspaper to you. Um, and one day he read this public service announcement about a group called the Thomas Circle Singers that had a dual mission of making wonderful music and supporting the community through raising funds through ticket sales. And I thought, that sounds really, really cool. I think I'll check that out. And so I signed up for an audition and the director was Jim Krieger and he let me in and I've been there ever since. That's great. So um, I didn't know about the Mennonite connection. That's really interesting. Um, so that's, that, that's, a, that's a new one. Um, for those that were uh, singing at the group with the group at that time um, in the early years, can you give us a sense of what it was like to sing with the group pre-jam? Uh, where were you rehearsing? How often would you perform? Um, just to give us a, a feel for what it was like. Well, we were a much smaller group at that point, um, probably about half of the number that we are now. Um, and we had much, uh, we had fewer concerts to sing. We did a Christmas concert, um, holiday concert. And then I think we did um, a concert in May of each year. Um, on occasion, we would, we were part of a Loban Circle house tour. So we would break up into quartets um, to do that uh, around, again, the holidays. And um, so we were smaller by far. And um, I think our quality was um, of, of a very different nature back then than we are now. We've, we've certainly grown from uh, Jim's phenomenal um, work with us to uh, teach us how to be an awesome uh, choral group. Yeah, I mean, I can remember um, having sectionals where it would just be like someone in the choir leading the sectional and it would, you know, someone who didn't necessarily have very, very much of a music training. Right. Um, and, um, you know, we, we didn't have the kind of professionalism we had today. You know, the programs were hand lettered. Um, <laughs> the recordings of the concerts were done by my husband with his boom box. And I don't, <laughs> really, I don't think anyone really listened to them afterwards except us, but we enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think there were a few occasions where we outnumbered the, the audience, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were wow. very committed. We really enjoyed rehearsing and performing together. Um, but it was very much friends singing with friends, you know, and it was not such the organization that we have today. How was music selected at the time? And who was leading the group? Um, so the, the director was Steve Green, who was the founding director, and he selected the music. He selected some very challenging music for us to perform that some of us were quite, maybe not quite up to, <laughs> but, um, but he had, you know, he had a commitment to the music um, and he had um, brought the choir from, from nothing, you know, to, to be able to perform and bring some music to the area. Deborah, do you want to add anything? No, I, you know, I didn't sing with the group pre-Jim, and so I, I know what it was like when I came in, but Jim was already there. But it was, as Wendy and Wendy have described, a small group um, with uneven knowledge um, of choral singing um, and capability. But certainly, as Wendy just said, everyone was totally committed to the mission and what, what the group was designed to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, still a very social group, it sounds like, too, which is something that has stayed the same, um, uh, brought to a, bringing us together because we love to sing. Well, um, you know, since Jim's been with the group for so long, I'm, I think all of us are really eager to hear um, what it was like when you first started as artistic director um, and how did that transition affect the group? What do you each recall and maybe Jim, you'd like to start um, since now we know how you how you responded to the the ad. But what was it? What was that like um, taking on this this group and um, and then for those that were singing at the time, how did that transition impact you all? Well, I think the the TCS board at the time had a really um, efficient and thorough audition process. 
uh, they interviewed many people and then they narrowed it down to four um, who had to come in and conduct a rehearsal. And part of the interview was uh, the, the audition, the application process was to submit a sample concert program, which is hard to do when you don't know the group. So I submitted a, a concert program and I, apparently they liked it. Um, I, I was hired by early November, as I recall now, and they had a December concert coming up. So I offered to sing with the group just to get to know people and sing in the Christmas concert. Plus they needed another tenor. Um, and for me, that was most advantageous because I got to find out what work the group needed. As I observed how they rehearsed, how they were being rehearsed, how they learned music. So I felt like I really had an advantage coming in um, in January and taking over. Um, the group was very receptive, um, very welcoming, and we did most of the program that I uh, submitted for my audition process um, for, for a June concert. And um, it was a good training time and just getting to know one another time and keeping things just the way they were. Folks, what was it like to change directors and have a new leader among you? And what was it like in those first couple of years? Well, one of the unusual things, uh, it would seem now unusual, was that the whole process for hiring Jim was, although the board organized it, but he was selected by a consensus of the singers. So all of the singers had decided this was who we wanted as our director. So um, we were really happy that, that Jim accepted the position. And um, we were, I think we were excited to, um, you know, to see how he could help us develop musically. I'm not sure, but did we have an accompanist before uh, Jim came on board? Um, I can't remember, but uh, we, we got an excellent accompanist too. And um, that was very key, of course, to our capacity to learn and, and work with the music, um, especially with a new director on board. And again, working with the programming, new programming too. Um, when I was so, hired, there was no accompanist. Um, former treasurer would sometimes play. Um, I, I accompanied most of the rehearsals myself. Oh, wow. We did a lot of acapella music, so I wouldn't have to be stuck behind the piano. It was a few years later that we started to hire accompanists. Okay. Well, Jim, thinking back, what, what were your biggest challenges, um, you know, at that time? And what were you... Um, what were your biggest aspirations as you, you know, this you finally got a new community choir, you, you're in it. Um, can you share what you were thinking about back then? Sure. Um, so you're dealing with, you know, two constituencies, but immediately the board and the singers. And, and um, the board wanted um, more, more audience and the singers um, wanted to make sure they felt comfortable and knew the music could perform it well. And I kept asking the board what their identity was. Were they an arts organization that did community service or were they a social service agency that put on concerts? And they, 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 they didn't know because I figured we, we, in order to, do, to succeed at both, we had to do one of them really well. And I thought what I can do is I can make this into a really good group. And if we're a really good group, it will help the other part of the mission. Uh, so that's, that was my focus for the first few years to get the board looking in that direction, um, which necess necessitated some gradual changes as in uh, re-auditioning singers, um, welcoming new singers into the group, uh, things of that nature. Oops, 
and you know, I think most everyone on the call uh, or this this webinar, or whatever we're calling it, this conversation, um, it, uh, is familiar with our dual mission. Um, sort of the the what we we have uh, made us so unique in the DC coral landscape, and certainly you know across the country that um, we're known for making beautiful music, but also contributing to the life of Washington uh, by contributing our some of our proceeds. Um, to beneficiaries. So that, that push-pull um, has always been um, something I know um, we have tried to balance over the years. Um, and I, I, I'm going to skip around a bit because um, Stuart and Margaret Willis Wells uh, had a great question. Um, since we have had the beneficiary history, um, uh, what have we heard back from some of our beneficiaries um, and how have um, they've been impacted uh, by our work. So I'm um, wondering for those of you that have worked with the beneficiaries in particular, um, would you share a little, a little feedback on that? It might be Deborah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was um, one of the people on the beneficiary partner committee for quite some time. And so I had the good fortune to work with a lot of our, our beneficiaries and <clears throat> For many of them, um, hearing our music was a new experience. Um, it was not a kind of music that they were familiar with, um, not something that they typically listened to. And very often, what I would hear back from them was how blown away they were by what not just what we sounded like and how good we were, but how wonderful the music was. Um, so we really had a chance to, to make the mission work in two directions, to uh, inform our audience about uh, the work of our beneficiary partners, but also to inform our beneficiary partners about beautiful music and what that could be. And that's been, a, that was always a very rewarding part of working with the beneficiary partners. <clears throat> and and did we always have a beneficiary from the get-go? Um, yeah, and then how did that evolve over the years? I know that during our, our tenure, Deborah, we, we, uh, we did evolve that, right? So can you mm -hmm. share a little bit more about how that evolved over the years and, and why? Mm -hmm. So TCS started, was started by Luther Place Memorial Church um, to support its N Street Village ministries largely. Uh, and they were the various ministries that are part of N Street were the beneficiaries for many of the concerts in the early years. Um, and then they, they began to branch out, if, if I remember correctly, and Wendy and Wendy will help me with this, um, the first non-N Street beneficiary partner was uh, Whitman Walker Clinic, which is right up this, or was at that time, right up the street. I believe that's correct. From, from Luther Place. Um, and so, but, but every concert then with a three concert season, once we had Jim as the director, uh, every concert had a different beneficiary partner. And so <clears throat> there was always um, a limit to how much we could do for any one individual partner because each concert was assigned to one. And there also wasn't any way to really build a long-term relationship with the partners for that reason. Um, so after a while, um, the board had been thinking about how that relationship worked and what was going to make it more effective. And um, the board realized that having one beneficiary partner for the full season would allow for the relationship building and allow us to do more for each partner. And so at that point, and I don't really remember what year that was, it's been quite a while since that happened. Um, but we, we moved to having one beneficiary partner per season. Um, and we really have had a wonderful relationship. Even this year, uh, with the effects of COVID-19 not being able to perform and raise funds for our, our current beneficiary partner, we're able to maintain the relationship with them into this coming season. Um, and I had the chance to, to go and visit their facility over on the other side of town and, and make friends with them, kind of. So I'm really pleased that we're able to, to continue working with them um, this year. Thanks, because I, you know, it's been such a large part of our history, but not everyone is familiar with how that's evolved over the years. Um, and just thinking about um, our legacy and the length of time that we've been around, um, we know that there have been a lot of changes in the group 
and for the organization. So we'd love to hear um, some of your um, stories and uh, reflections on how things have changed. Um, what were the pivotal and significant moments for you um, and for you and the group? Jim, I'd love to hear your, your perspective on that. And then, um, you know, our fellow singers. Uh, actually, I was gonna, since I'm the one that made most of the changes, <laughs> I was going to suggest that the singers go first. <laughs> All right. Who wants to, to pick up on that? Wendy Shank? Sure. Um, I would say one of my proudest moments was when we were, um, we became um, Washingtonian of the year in the year 2000. Um, it was great to be recognized for our, our, our musicianship and to have really achieved that particular status and to be um, honored so so uh, so nicely by Washington as a whole, um, and I think it ushered in um, a, a great uh, couple of decades for us in terms of um, how we were regarded and and people heard about had finally heard about us in a way that perhaps they hadn't previous to that. And um, so we got invitations to go perform at some really phenomenal uh, places. We've performed at the Renwick Gallery, Blair House. Um, I think we were part of World AIDS Day when we were partnered with uh, Whitman Walker. Um, uh, lots of places, uh, National Gallery of Art. Um, other people can chime in here with other places and spaces, but um, that was one of, uh, one, of the, one, of, um, one of my proudest moments um, to see how far we'd come and, and to look back now. That was sort of a midpoint for, for uh, my connection with the group and um, I think we've only gotten better as we've expanded and we've sort of come into our own as we partner with our new beneficiaries on a, on a more consistent uh, basis. So we introduce music to them uh, in a way perhaps they haven't known before and they introduce the kind of outreach they have to the community that we may not have known before. And I think that's, that's a great way to build community from all different sides. Um, I don't know if you can see what I'm holding here, but it is my invitation to the 2000 Washingtonians of the Year event that the award was given to us. I, it meant so much to me, Wendy, I'm totally with you on that. It meant so much to me that as you can see, I still have that invitation and I, I keep it in my calendar. Um, but but a, a thing that, that happened that really was powerful for me was the first time that we performed in a location <clears throat> away from, uh, away from Luther Place, away from Thomas Circle. We did a concert performance uh, up in St. Columbus Church up in Tenley Town. And <clears throat> up until then, as Wendy Bond was saying earlier, our, and Wendy Shank as well, our audiences had been kind of small. St. Columbus is my parish. We got to St. Columbus for that performance and there were people in every seat there were people standing in the aisles. There were people standing four deep in the back of the church. They were up in the gallery. They were everywhere. I think there were a couple of people hanging from the light fixtures. There were, and so I spent the entire concert with one eye reading the music and watching Jim and the other eye trying to count how many people were in the room. <laughs> um, I was the, the concert series coordinator there at that time. And so I had a good sense of how many, how many seats there were. And, and the estimate that I came up with was 450 people. It was just stunning just stunning. Of course, since then, we've performed in various places that seat more people than that, and we've had audiences bigger than that, uh, particularly for the Christmas concert. But that was an amazing experience for me to see that we could draw that much of, a, of an audience and share our music with that size of an audience and share our mission with, with that size of an audience. That was a Christmas concert. <laughs> 
I remember that. I think so. I think and so. we were we were the pick of the week in the Washington Post that weekend. We were, which really was a in major the weekend boost. section. Yeah, in the weekend right. section. The weekend so that section. was a major boost. Yep. Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, one of my highlights too. Wendy Bond, what are some what are some of the changes or pivotal moments you want to share? Well, Wendy and Deborah have covered really a lot of really um, really cool events. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, why don't you let J Jim go ahead? Okay. Uh, I won't repeat what anyone else has said, but when um, uh, Lynette Arledge, who was a former board chair, decided that during her tenure as board chair, we would get a website, which was something new, and we would get an office because all the work was to be done by board members in their homes and papers and records were everywhere. And we started off by sharing half an office at Luther Place Church and we hired our first um, part-time um, administrator. And it, it, it was a big step for us. And of course, now we have Aaron Feng, we have our own office, we've, we've left Luther Place. I mean, those, those were, those were big moves too for us, big changes, moving from Luther Place, because we just, we outgrew the space. We needed much bigger space. And, um, you know, they were, they were good to us. They gave us roots and they gave us wings. And uh, all we did was fly across the street to National City Christian Church, which had a much bigger rehearsal space for us, had a much bigger office for us. And then, of course, um, now we're at Church of the Epiphany, which I think for many is their favorite space in which to rehearse of the three we've been. And uh, we have our office there. Definitely. Uh, other changes are when we started to realize that part of our mission would be to commission works um, whenever possible. And our first work was commissioned to celebrate our 25th anniversary. Um, our Dear friend Patty Teal, who's here today, was the one who made that possible and started a trend and a, a pattern of, of, um, of commissions. And I believe we've commissioned six or seven pieces now. And uh, that's an important, important stepping stones, stepping points for TCS. Um, I'll leave it with this. And, um Polly reminded me in the chat that um, there have been a lot of changes with the music library over the years. <laughs> um, uh, you know, originally, um, it, there was a, a series of binders with the, each of the pieces in them, then with a note where you could find the pieces in the file cabinet. And um, when I became music librarian, we were entering the data on a computer, but we had a very old fashioned database now it's much easier to um, find information about the library on the database and uh, it's very much more organized. Um, we've, it's the music library has grown. We have about 800 pieces in the music library, I think. It's a huge number. Um, the one thing that has not changed is that there's always too much music and we don't have enough file cabinets for it. <laughs> Well, I also remember that um, in the in the early early days, some of our music was stored in the bell tower yeah. at Luther Place Memorial Church. It was very scattershot, and our rehearsal space also was shared with a student hostel and um, homeless shelter. So, upon entering on any uh, any Tuesday evening, there might be sleeping bags piled in the corner somewhere. Um, our music could have been shifted from one area to another. Um, it, it was a uh, very different theme then. Well, and we were at Luther Place. So I know, you know, for those of us living in and around DC, we've seen the city really change. I'm curious what it was like to rehearse at Thomas Circle uh, back in the late 80s and uh, yeah, mid to late 80s, early 90s. Um, I think, Deborah, you had some interesting stories to share um, when people would look out the window. <laughs> well, when I first started, yes, <laughs> um, my, my friend Ann Talty and I 
uh, joined TCS together in that first year. And I didn't have a car at that time. And so she had to drive every week. Um, and we would drive down together because I was her navigator through DuPont Circle so that she wouldn't go on the wrong side of the island and we'd end up somewhere other than Thomas Circle. So, so we would uh, drive down together, but there was a parking lot across N Street, directly across N Street from the church. Uh, the, the buildings that are there now for N Street Village Ministries were not there at that time. And that parking lot, um, and I know Wendy Shank remembers this vividly too, that parking lot was a gathering place and a happening place for all kinds of activities um, that you might not want to participate in yourself. And so the residue of that was always on the ground. Uh, we called it the rat lot, we called it the condom lot, we called it a lot of things. <laughs> um, it was, uh, and it had this huge, huge pothole in the middle of it that we always had to navigate around with the cars. Um, so that was that was one rather vivid memory that I have of, of those early days. The dicey neighborhood, um, e even, uh, even in broad daylight, I would say, but certainly at night. And um, we had to leave together so that mm -hmm. uh, everybody would be navigating the streets on their own. Right. There's a lot of action. In more mm -hmm. ways than one. Uh, <laughs> so, not, not necessarily of the musical kind, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so a lot's changed. This is pre Whole Foods on P Street. So uh, a lot of a lot of uh, evolution, just like our own group. Um, how has the group become more professional over time? I and mean, we've, we've talked about some of the steps, but is there anything else that you want to share, I mean, as, as singers that have gone through this, or, or Jim, as you were sort of shaping the group along the way? I'm always happy to let the singer speak oh, for I, 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 I wanna just say that I think that as, as our quality improved, we had um, a, a lot of um, musicians who would jump at the chance to be our to accompany our work, um, and Jim Jim found a phenomenal stable of fantastic musicians in the Washington area to come and um, be our orchestra or our our harpist or whoever, and we benefited so much by by their musicianship and professionalism. Um, so that was a that was a thrill to again be able to attract such fantastic um, musicians to come and play with us, whether it was the Commonwealth Brass or um, uh, any, any number of other um, soloists who joined us uh, across the years. And uh, it, it, was, it was great as a singer who also started out, <laughs> I was, I was an infant when I joined, so um, uh, to to grow and <laughs> recognize that I, as a singer, had grown, and um, and here I got to sing in a group with professional musicians who were hired by some of the top uh, groups in all of D.C. and they wanted to and, and they wanted to come and perform with us, and and it was great to recognize how far we come, especially, and that was another marker for me. I feel like I'm more of a, I'm certainly not a professional, but I'm certainly more professional uh, in my musicianship than I would ever have been if I hadn't signed with TCS. Um, just learning things about how to articulate, how to stand, how to think about, think ahead, how to read ahead in the music and know what's coming up. All the things that Jim stresses with us um, and that some of us who sing in church choirs get kind of snarky about when we're with our church choirs because, you know, church choirs are volunteer choirs too and they often don't do the things that we do in TCS. Um, and so, but I really do feel that my own musicianship has grown tremendously over the years that I've been with TCS. Um, Jim's a, a fabulous teacher, a really wonderful teacher. And, uh, and I've benefited from that. And I think the group as a whole has certainly benefited from that. Jim, 
What are your thoughts? Sorry, who did you ask, Krista? Oh, sorry, I was asking Jim, but Wendy, yeah, if you have something on, yeah. pop in, that'd be great. I mean, I, I feel that we've also benefited from having um, people who've done really well with um, fundraising and with maintaining TCS financially, because that, um, that that's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that as thing as we don't always know about. But I remember times when TCS has really struggled financially and that's been, been difficult, but, but everyone's been committed to keep going. But to have other people take care of that so we can focus on the music is just really, really wonderful. And I think there's a lot of professionalism in that. That's a good point, Wendy. I, I, I think TCS as a whole has become a really well-oiled machine and works really well. And uh, that's because there are so many people who do so much behind the scenes. I mean, at the concert, people see my back, but it's, it's so much, and I even tell the singers Tuesday nights, there's so much that's going on during the week so that we can be there on Tuesday nights to make the music. Um, I, I think that um, with the professionalism, it's, it's you know, I don't know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Uh, we started attracting better singers so we had better performances or we had better performances so we started attracting better singers but it kind of all came together and um, I think singers we, we learn to sing a certain way people know what I people in the group know what I want and what I like and, and oh we'll do it Jim's way okay and they can go sing with another director and do it that director's way that's fine but when they're in front of me I want it done my way and um, singers who've been with the group for a long time know what that is. And new singers have to learn it quickly, but some things are better caught than taught. And so I think returning singers help to teach new singers a lot. Just on, I'm getting my music in order before rehearsal starts. Um, it's time to begin. I'm singing, I'm sitting up. I'm marking things with my music. And I'm putting my phone away. Put the phone away. I mean, it's, it's um, yeah, I think the singers teach one another a lot. And that raises... But we're also, we've also been the huge beneficiary of your vision, Jim. Um, and that's clear from the moment you lift the baton at a rehearsal. Um, you have a very specific idea of what we need to accomplish in a given evening in order to be able to perform the concert that you have envisioned for us perform by a specific time. And your capacity to have that vision and communicate it through rehearsals and to execute it in a way that makes us want to be at rehearsals also, uh, I think, to me has been um, so helpful in, in, in teaching me to be such a, a better singer than I was when I first came on board. And um, I, I think we owe such a huge um, debt of gratitude to you for having that vision to get so consistent in, in how it's executed so that uh, the, the end product is satisfying, not just to the audience, but to those of us who are participants. Thank you, Wendy. I, I just want to make sure we always end on time. That's my biggest goal. <laughs> yeah, and we do. Well, we have to start on time to do that, too. <laughs> exactly. Um, I would encourage um, those of you, particularly singers um, and new singers, if you do have questions, now's a great time to pitch them to people that have um, been with the group for a long time or something that you've always wanted to know. Um, I want to I want to veer a little bit because I think that you there must have been funny or completely strange things that have happened at at performances. What's the strangest or funniest thing that's happened um, at at a concert in your tenure? Well, I have a family memory, um, which I don't know if anyone else remembers. But one year we were doing. Um, some pieces by PDQ Bach, and there was a madrigal that ended up 
Sweet Love Has Left the Spring. And of course, there's a play on words. So it goes boing, boing, boing. And my daughter, who must have been about eight at the time, was um, in the show because she got to go across the front of the church on her pogo stick. (laughs) (laughs) I forgot about that. (laughs) (laughs) But that's a a memory I'll always have. (laughs) Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The one I have is um, from our 25th anniversary concert at National City Christian Church. And we were doing a premiere of a world premiere of our first commission work. And um, one of our singers got a terrible cold and couldn't sing the concert. And so she opted to sit out. And one of the pieces we were performing with, with orchestra was Mozart's Ave Verum Corpus. And as we started that, she's out in the audience and she starts a coughing fit. And to try to mute it, she slides under her pew. And of course, it's a marble floor. <laughs> and so it's this loud resonant cough during the entire performance of the piece. <laughs> And I can look back, look back at it now and laugh. At the time it was, I'm sure I was furious. But I remember what we did at the end of the concert as an encore, we repeated the Mozart I Verum and it was silent so the audience could hear it. Yeah. Well, I, I also remember us performing, uh, was it Brother Heinrich's um, Christmas? And uh, we had a reader who was reading with us who uh, had to leave the stage literally in the middle of, um, of her narration of the piece. And um, uh, Deborah Kennedy Coster um, <laughs> stepped up to the microphone and um, literally Jim was holding a cord and um, this speaker had to look for a medical reason um, and uh, Deborah stepped in and without missing a beat literally uh, picked up the narration and kept going and um, I had a look of horror I, around I think face. perhaps <laughs> I had no idea what was going to happen well, you just kept uh, the the musicians who were accompanying us. You just kept them going in the measure, and they followed you. And um, literally, uh, Deborah stepped in. And if per- perhaps if you were in the audience, you might have noticed it, but it, there wasn't very much of a of a, of a um, hiccup at all. Well, I can, tell you, um, I can tell you who did notice it, who did notice it was Patty Teal, who's with us today and who was our house manager for that concert. And she was backstage. And the young woman who was the narrator, um, her medical emergency was an epileptic seizure. She knew it was coming on. She could feel it. And she turned to us, the singers, and she said, somebody take over for me. And then she went backstage. And what I did not find out until later was when she got backstage, as she went into the seizure, Patty was catching her in her arms and the young woman gripped onto Patty's arms and Patty had bruises that I think she probably had for a month from that experience. It was really a very scary uh, experience actually for a lot of us. It was. Um, Anyway, but I I have one that comes from performing at National City Christian and it was when we did when Ola Yellow uh, wrote a commissioned work for us. And Ola is a wonderful composer and he's very attached to the works that he writes. And so when they are premiered, he likes to be there to be the pianist for the, or to be the keyboardist for the, perf- the premiere performance. So he came, and fortunately he came to rehearse with us ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> so, but we're all standing there <clears throat> to sing the music and Jim is out to direct and Ola is sitting at the keyboard and we're going along and all of a sudden Ola stops and Jim stops and they look at each other and okay we'll back up we'll start for measure 10 again and they started again stopped again 
and it turned out and Ola said, well, no, that you're, you know, there's a, there's a note that's wrong that the singers are singing a wrong note there. And Jim said, well, no, they're singing whatever the note was. <clears throat> and Ola said, that's not what's in the music. <laughs> he, had a, he, he had a different edition of the music than Jim had. <laughs> and as they were discussing that back and forth between the two of them, back and forth, it's a D, no, it's a D flat, it's a D, no, it's a D flat. <laughs> And we're looking at our music and suddenly somebody in the bass section raises his hand and says, we don't have either of those notes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, well, you know, that happens when you write music, I guess. <laughs> you know, you go through different, different versions and you make different decisions about things. And so at, right there, um, Ola decided which note he wanted all of us to have <laughs> at the same time. Um, and that was, but that was pretty funny. That was pretty entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. It's a great story. And so, you know, we've had so many commissions. Um, there's a question from, from one of our uh, attendees about um, wanting to know more about how commissions come about. And, um, you know, when someone wants to commission a piece, how does the composer get picked and all that? So, uh, Jim, could you illuminate that for us, for those people that don't really know what the commissioning process is and how we make our selections? So it, um, for us, our procedure has been someone has come forward and said, I would like to commission a work for TCS. And um, they tell me an amount they are interested in, in con contributing. And I, um, approach some composers or a composer that I'm interested in after discussing it with the potential donor. And um, all composers or, or most composers charge uh, by the minute. Um, I keep getting a, a warning that my internet connection is unstable. So I apologize if I'm freezing on you. Uh, they charge by the minute. So some are a thousand dollars a minute and that's a thousand dollars for a minute of music. And once we decide on what the price is and uh, how long the piece will be, I have never um, given them any other um, parameters other than to let them know, uh, try not to divide past, um, you know, 12 Parts and um, let them know what instruments will be at their disposal. And uh, they choose, they select their own texts. And um, you just wait uh, uh, with bated breath when they say, um, I'm finished, um, I'm sending you the, the work. And we've, we've been pretty successful in that realm. Yeah. And several of our commissions have gone on to be published and have received you know, countless performances across the country. Yeah, it's great that we've been able to contribute to a canon that's ever growing for choral music and that TCS has played a role in that for many other choirs and given so many other, particularly young composers, an opportunity to really um, expand their, their rep. So we're coming towards the end of our discussion. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the changes uh, that's happened in our own organization, how, how singers have evolved, how, how Jim has evolved. Um, what hasn't changed? And, and what has sustained you over the, the time and course that you've been involved with the group? Well, what certainly well, I would have to changed say for me the, is... Go ahead, Deborah. Go ahead. What certainly hasn't changed for me is um, the joy of, of learning and performing the music. Um, the, just the, the wonderful feeling of singing with other people. Now I'm going to cry because I can't sing with other people right now, and none of us can. Um, <clears throat> but singing in a small group where my voice really makes a difference, but I am also sustained by the voices all around me. Um, and that, that doesn't change. Whatever the quality of the group, it's better when the quality is better, but it's always wonderful, no matter what the quality is. It's always wonderful to sing with other people. Yes, I would, I would say to that, it's the commitment to the music that's never changed. Um, 
we've been on the brink of um, not being able to perform in 2008 when um, the bottom out of the economy and um, a lot of our funding, especially for grants, dried up. Um, we were sure we were going to be able to reopen doors for a next concert, but um, we've we found a way, and um, I hope that we also find a way to get through what is the hardest struggle I think in my entire tenure with the group, which is not being able to sing in person um, together to to as Jim has said before to hear your part in a chord. Um, uh, that, is, that is a difficult um, obstacle to overcome at this juncture. Um, but I have to have hope that um, we'll find a way on the other end um, to stand back together and perform some additional phenomenal music um, that's waiting for us. And, and I would just echo all that Deborah and Wendy have said about the, just the joy of singing in a group. And there's, it's like nothing else, no other experience that, that we can have. And, and I, I just like to add to it, I really, I, I really enjoy communicating our joy of the music to the audience and sharing the music with other people. That is also a really big part of what we do. Um, and I'm, I've just been so impressed with how um, how TCS has really stuck together during this challenge when we can't sing together and how many people are still committed to, to meet together, oh, yeah. to keep up their musicianship, to keep up their singing. Um, I think there's a tremendous community in our group, which is why we've been there for, for so long. And that's just still continuing now, I think, even though we can't be in person together. I think TCS has always been a very resilient and, and flexible group. And uh, they, they kind of go with the times and go with, with, with change, even though initial change was difficult. Um, I think once they learned that change can be good, but just thinking how TCS started off with like Wendy Shank said, two concerts a year. Then we, we added a third concert and then um, we started adding a fourth concert. And actually, Krista, I think with you, we added a, the fall preview event, which was a November event. So we didn't have to go from May until December and not see our audience. We, we gave everyone a season preview in November. Uh, and then had a December, March, May. And the, the group has just... E e um, moved and, um, tr you know, transformed itself. I think, um, you know, we're going to come out of this finding that we have new ways to keep in touch with our audience, not just at concerts, that we can do other events. And this, this is a great opportunity for us to, you know, as TCS moves ahead for the next five years and, you know, sees big changes and, you know, they, th there'll be great opportunities ahead for the group. And um, it's, a, it's an awesome, awesome organization. Yeah, we all feel that way. And, and hopefully you all do too, or else you wouldn't be here. Um, and this has been a, a year uh, unlike any uh, for our TCS history and certainly for, for each of us. But, you know, um, what I think we've all intimated here is that community has sustained us. Um, uh, change has been good for us. We've been able to grow and evolve. I suspect that this is no different of a time. And, um, you know, we look forward to being able to, to do that with you. Um, and I don't see any other, other questions, but I just want to give everyone an opportunity to maybe share some final thoughts about what you look forward to, you know, in terms of um, this liminal space that we're in, even though we're not able to make music together, what do you think it bodes? How do you think it bodes for our future? Well, I'll just repeat what I said at the end of the um, 
the little recording that I did for TCS, my reflection for TCS, which is that people, people who know a lot more than I do about technology and music are working really hard to make it possible for singing and music to happen together in a virtual context. Um, we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. And I think ultimately um, we will have a better, a more flexible um, and bigger way to sing together and to have our audience join us. <clears throat> Great. Well, I, um, it's been a joy to walk down the memories uh, with you all. I hope all those that are, that are participating have enjoyed the time. Um, we look forward to having you with us um, as we carve out and, and, and new space and new opportunities uh, for the group to connect with you and to connect with each other. And um, Jim, do you have any final thoughts before we sign off? I just want to thank you, Krista, Deborah, Wendy, and Wendy for a most meaningful conversation this afternoon. For me, it was a lot of fun traveling down memory lane with the four of you. Um, thank you also again to Aaron thank Tang, you. our administrative director, for hosting the event for us. We appreciate that, Aaron. And finally, thank you. thank you to those of you who joined us this afternoon as we kicked off the 45th anniversary of the Thomas Circle Singers. Um, I hope you will consider joining us for other events that we have scheduled for the remainder of 2020, all of which can be found on our website. I know Aaron's been posting all of these in the chat as we've been going along. She's always on top of everything. So thank you all very much. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.